Welcome to Dem Bahamians, a media initiative of the Bahamian American Cultural Society. The mission of the society is to expose the culture of the Bahamian peoples to the world uh, through uh, culture, visual arts, culinary arts, music skills and performing arts, as well as literary art. And uh, today, my uh, guest is Sonia Farmer. Uh, she is the founder of Ponciana Paper Press in the Bahamas. And uh, literary art form is one of the um, cultural components that she uses as her background for um, the work that she's doing. Um, Sonia, I want to welcome Sonia. I want to welcome you to the Bahamians. Thank you for having me. And um, also, um, I want to say that um, Sonia is uh, hailed from the Bahamas, beautiful Bahama Islands, from which I hail. Um, you probably some of my guests might know Bahamas as um, sun, sand, and sea. But um, we're going to be talking about another component of our culture, something that. Um, that we want to also um, share with my audience as well as share with the world. Um, Sonia, um, you know, you're a founder of uh, Ponciana Paper Press. Um, I want you to, to tell me, um, how did you first get started in, um, or, or found the interest in, in printing? Sure. Well, first of all, um, Ponciana Paper Press right now is a independent publishing press based out of Nassau, the Bahamas, where I live and work and where I grew up, like you said. Yeah. Um, I specialize in handmade books or what uh, a lot of people may refer to as chat books, uh, which are very short collections of fiction or poetry. And also now I'm going into a little bit of visual art as well. So all of the books incorporate some sort of handmade aspect, whether it be uh, bound by needle and thread in uh, a limited edition of 100, or letterpress printed covers, sometimes some uh, silk screen or linoleum sort of printmaking techniques, mm -hmm. and even handmade paper. So I incorporate all of these and make limited editions of about, you know, 30 to 200 books or so. And, I, and so they're sort of like art objects, but the book themselves, the physical form, also becomes part of the storytelling process. And that's mm -hmm. why I love doing this. I like to sort of expand the story into this visual art as well, and to keep the crafts of books alive, book mm -hmm. making and letterpress printing and these sort of ancient techniques that are dying out in the digital age. Right, right. Uh -huh. um, so I'm the only one doing that there in Nassau right now in this way. There mm -hmm. are people publishing, but I do this handmade sort of aspect. So Poinciana Paper Press releases books, and I've done, uh, I would say, about seven books so far. And since I've been home, I'm restoring an old printing press. Okay. And um, through that, I've realized that Poinciana Paper Press can actually encompass a larger vision whereby we actually become a place, I would say sort of almost a hub for this kind of activity, bookbinding, letterpress printing, printmaking, hand paper making, where artists and writers, not only in the Bahamas, but from the region, the wider Caribbean region and even the world, can collaborate and make artwork or um, have poetry readings or uh, workshops and just to keep these techniques alive in the Caribbean mm -hmm. and also enter ourselves into the international conversation in these sort of art crafts. Right. So that's what we do mm -hmm. and, and what we would like to do, what I, I would like to do. Mm -hmm. But how I got started is um, I, I've actually, I went to school to study writing. I went to Pratt Institute here right. in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I thought I wanted to be a journalist. The joke is that after I graduated and moved home, I still did go into journalism. Okay. <laughs> However, <laughs> I thought I wanted to be a journalist. So I went to study writing at Pratt and somewhere Right in the middle of my studies, I took a class called The Art of the Book with Miriam Sher. She's a very well-known book artist. Mm -hmm. And that, to use this cliche, that did change my life. Okay. And I found, out that, I found out that making my own books was actually a very empowering process. And I thought, this is what I want to keep doing. I, because I, I do write. I write poetry and fiction. And I wanted to create the vessels that they came in mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. make it very arty. And so... 
from there, it was just sort of this journey of discovering different ways I could make that happen because I didn't have too much skill to go on really. I didn't ever know anything about bookbinding. I had a very uh -huh. basic understanding of printmaking and a lot mm -hmm. of printmaking techniques, uh, relief printing, silkscreen, uh, etching can go into book arts, can go hand in hand with book arts. Okay. So mm -hmm. all of my electives for the last half of my semester, when I could get away with it, uh, were in these art fields. So I took a silkscreen class, I took a relief class, I also um, interned with paper making places because okay. I thought I would like to learn how to make paper as well. Mm. Since I love paper, I found that I had a really, I, I really, really loved paper when I started handling it for my books. Mm -hmm. So I interned with, um, you know, really great book artists and paper makers at the top of their field, like Robin Amy Silverberg. She mentored me for almost two years. I still visit her to this day when I come to New York. Okay. She's a major influence on me. She taught me how to make paper and also a lot of book binding techniques. And from there, I also discovered letterpress printing. And letterpress printing is an ancient um, technique from the Gutenberg days uh, of movable type. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you would set type, right. you know, set sentences, mm -hmm, and every mm -hmm. every letter, every space, every punctuation mark has a little piece of lead with the printed thing on it. Right, so you'd yeah. arrange that, apply ink, put the paper on, and apply pressure, and get your print. So it's sort of like printmaking, right. relief printing. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is how books were printed before the digital age. and. Now, they sort of faded into the background, and now that the digital age is really in full swing and we, we're, we're going right into the future where everything is going to be digital, right. you would think that this craft would be dying out, but it's sort of the opposite. There's this sort of um, backlash against the digital, the digital age where people actually want the tactile feel. Um, people want to you know, feel the paper, smell the book, um, feel the the type pressed into the paper and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, some, I mean, not everyone. And we, it's not an either or situation either. It's not about only print or only digital, but this idea that they can both, both exist in these ways. So I got into letterpress printing. I worked at a, a press a printer here, um, Peter Crudy Editions, for a year. I did a lots of wedding invitations and things okay. like that, but mm -hmm. it trained me really, really well. And I also discovered um, small independent presses. Um, people, writers mostly, who decide to publish their own work or work by their friends in okay. these limited edition handbound things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, chapbooks can be anything. They can be Xeroxed sheets of paper that you staple together, right. um, or maybe you don't even staple them together and you just <laughs> leave them around. Or maybe they are very elaborately prepared, you know, hand set, letterpress printed, handmade paper. Um, beautiful objects in limited editions, it's totally up to the publisher how they want to, mm -hmm, to share mm -hmm. their writing. But the idea is taking publishing into your own hands. Okay. So you incorporate silk screening into your... Yes, yep. I, I incorporate um, a lot of techniques into what I do. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I learned ways or to you know establish a small press and, and or, or sort of got inspired because there's no wrong way to have a small press. But okay. I became inspired by volunteering at um, with different small presses. So I volunteered with um, Small Anchor, is a press that my friend started, and mm -hmm. then I volunteered with Ugly Duckling Press, which is another small independent press That's in Brooklyn. In the Bahamas or here in no, no, New York. in Brooklyn, in New in York. Brooklyn, yeah, yeah. Okay. while I lived in New York, I lived in New York uh, for five okay. years. Okay. So any opportunity I had, I would volunteer or intern with people who could teach me something that mm -hmm. I could um, put into Poinciana Paper Press. Okay. So that I knew when I went home, no one would be able to help me anymore because I'm the only person really doing this sort uh -huh. of thing back home. So, uh -huh. um, so I had to know what I was doing. Okay. So I spent as much time as I could just absorbing and learning from people who already were in the field or mm -hmm. at the top of their craft. Right. And, uh, and it's made me confident enough that I've gone home and I've started to establish my own small press studio. So, so you had an idea before you graduated that you were going to go in yes. that direction mm -hmm. um, eventually. Yes, uh -huh. I, I uh -huh. knew that I wanted to move home um, and do have a small press and have sort of a, a hub for making you know printed ephemera in the Bahamas mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we didn't have that kind of setup there yet. 
Uh -huh. We have a mm -hmm. very vibrant contemporary art scene, very vibrant, very exciting, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and people are exploring different forms of art making. So I thought this is the time for me to be home right, and right. do this. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that's why I moved home in 2010. Okay. Oh, okay. And I set about um, finding an old printing press because you know how Bahamians go. Right, they don't right. throw nothing away. Oh. <laughs> so I <laughs> thought there must be some ancient presses hanging around somewhere. It's the back of some government building or something, right? Right, right. And I, of course, I still did have to work. So I ended up getting a job at the Nassau Guardian newspaper. Uh -huh. So that's the whole joke. I eventually did end up going into journalism. Okay. <laughs> I started out as a proofreader and then I ended up um, having holding the arts and culture editor title for a while as well and I wrote a lot of stories about Bahamian arts and culture which further sort of put me back into the space that I had been absent from for five years mm -hmm. so that I could make connections and see how my press could fit in and what I found was a lot of artists were really excited about what I could do mm -hmm. so I thought I'm gonna do it and I did find a press um, I was turned on to the Johnson family uh, mm -hmm. Their father, Oscar Johnson Sr., who's well known, right, yes. uh -huh. um, he had a printing press called the Craftsman Press. Mm -hmm. And um, through his, his children, um, they were the ones who to take me around to see the presses and to negotiate a deal where I could purchase the presses from them and the type and mm -hmm. whatever else equipment would go with these presses. Um, so the Craftsman Press, after uh, Oscar Johnson Sr. stopped printing, to their credit, they didn't throw anything away. Okay. They let it stay there. So that's very exciting because a lot of the time these presses just meet their end in scrapyards. Right. So it was uh, very, very great that they kept these presses mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was it was a lengthy process, of course, because you know they want to make sure that it goes into the right hands, that I'm going to treat it properly, because it's our father's legacy. Right. It's a pretty right. big deal, and right. I feel very mm -hmm. honored to be able to carry it on. Mm -hmm. and and do some exciting work with these presses. Mm -hmm. So um, I have two uh, two printing electronic printing presses from him. One okay. that's called a Chandler and Price, and the other one that's called a Heidelberg. Mm -hmm. And then also a small proofing press, which is what I do the majority of my work on right now while I'm fixing the other two presses. Right. And then also the really exciting part too is that they have all of these type cases, which is the drawers where all of these movable type pieces are stored. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And every drawer is a different font, a different size. So there, there are, I think, about 200 in all oh. that I'm going back now to restore. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. So setting up the press has been a lengthy process. Okay. I just sort of do what I can, uh -huh. because you know the phrase, right? right. Start where you are, uh, use what you have, do what you can. Right, and that's right. really what I've been mm -hmm. operating mm -hmm. on for okay. the past two years. Mm -hmm. Because I came from you know, New York where I trained with um, people at the top of their craft who had all the right equipment um, and then and now I'm really I'm, I'm on my own at home. Okay. So now, seeing that you have worked uh, with other machinery here in New York City mm -hmm. and compared to to with, to Craftsman Press printing uh, how, what's the similarity? Is there any similarity? Of course uh -huh. yeah yeah it's, mm -hmm. it's similar um, I trained on sort of a flatbed press and the press that I have is a different kind of press mm -hmm. from the Craftsman Press. Uh, however, I do know how to use it. Mm -hmm. Luckily, because I, uh, although I am sort of an art, RT kind of press, I'm still a printing press. Mm -hmm. And printing presses get exemptions in the Bahamas. Okay. So I've been able to get exemption on most printing material, not all. Okay. But mm -hmm. um, that's been a big help. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. you know, for me because it's quite a financial burden, but um, it it is also quite a process. It's very mm -hmm. lots of red tape, lots of things you have to go through. Applications take a long time to get through, so it's not exactly like you're in the clear when you are a printing press and you have an exemption. There's mm -hmm. there are still a lot of steps that go towards getting an exemption on your art supplies so yeah, uh -huh. because culture is a very viable economic path for our country mm -hmm. but we have we're Bahamian yeah and we have this really exciting contemporary art scene mm -hmm. that and we're all a very very supportive art community that apparently isn't really found in a lot of other Caribbean countries so that's exciting we should be 
we should be marketing our art forms and our art forms beyond junk canoe because we don't want to take the easy way out and say right, that we support junk canoe mm -hmm. because there's a lot of other stuff going on. Right. And relieving us of 45% duty, that's steep. 45% yeah. duty on imported art is, supplies. That's it would make high. sense if there were art supplies, you know, made in the country. Yeah. But there aren't. There's nothing made in the country, so okay. I'm not too sure what we're protecting here. Yeah. An art supply here in New York City is not. Is not. The United States is not cheap. <laughs> no. So you can imagine so, plus. You so know. It's, it's quite a, a costly um, item when you add that 45% yeah. duty on it. Yeah. Relieving that plus, would be the first step in supporting us. Yeah, that would be that would be uh, quite a tremendous help. It would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, when for that like tax exemption, is that every year or is that six months or how is that? It, how you do have you to apply for everything. Every year. That comes or every in. time you bring every in something. Every time you bring something in. But okay. in order to apply, you also need to renew your business license every year. But right. you have to do that uh -huh, no matter uh -huh, what uh -huh. business you have, of yeah. course. Now, how is the um, the business? You know, when for for for, for, for books that you're you're you're, you're, you're publishing right well is there a market is there a there is not exactly a huge market I mean here's the thing um, when you're talking about publishing the traditional right now large publishing model mm -hmm. in a place like the Bahamas you can't have really economic success because we're such a small market even mm -hmm. if you sold one book to every Bahamian, it wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, you you can't even reach that. So I don't. I throw that away. What I'm interested in are printing books that go to people who who want to read them, books mm -hmm. that are very very important to our cultural conversation, books that tell very important stories about mm -hmm. the real lives of Bahamians, uh, contemporary past, whatever, through poetry and fiction, and so. And that does go to a small market. That's why my editions are very limited, 100, 100 edition books, for the most part on average, just editions mm -hmm. of 100. Um, but they are affordable uh, as art books. Uh -huh. So I don't you know, charge huge amounts of money. Usually my books um, mm -hmm. range from $15 uh, to 30 if it's a very exceptionally handmade book. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, so I just want to get the work out there into the hands of people who are hungry for our culture. Mm -hmm. One of, it might, I might be jumping the gun, but one of the things that I would really like to do in the future under the press is not just print new work or by emerging artists or um, new work by established artists, mm -hmm. but also reprint out of print books by Bahamian authors who are no longer in our cultural consciousness, okay. but who we need to be teaching to our school children. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. so like what, who for instance? Uh, Marcella Taylor is one of them. She was an exceptional um, Bahamian poet mm -hmm. who lived and taught abroad. She wrote beautiful poetry. Um, her books are out of print. Um, some of them are selling for use on Amazon for quite a bit of money. So mm -hmm. she's one of them. Of course, there are so many things that go into this process okay. to do uh -huh. with copyright and all of that. Right. But right. because um, our publishing model has always been one of sort of authors self-publishing themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so many books are out of print now, mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. we don't know. We've lost touch with sort of our historical literary landscape for the most part. You know, right. we still have our major people that we touch on. Right, right. Um, yeah. But, and of course, um, a press that I'd like to give a shout out to is Guanima Press run by um, Patricia Glinton Mikolas oh, and yes. uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. Nico Mikolas, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. publish uh, really great work and keep that going, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, besides that, it's a little sad out there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so, uh, and the, the real unfortunate thing that happens when we don't value our literature is that we don't teach our children to value our literature, right, and then right. we don't teach them to value that part of our culture. Mm -hmm, we exactly, teach them that yeah. only Kong Salad and Junk Canoe is culture, right. but they don't realize that you know a play by Dr. Ian Strawn is culture, mm -hmm, or right, right, yeah. you know mm -hmm. a poem by Obadiah Michael Smith is culture, right, and right. that they too can create these things. Yeah, well, you find that they bring in on uh, outside exactly. Um, Text. Poetry, or which is fine because it's good to place um, ourselves in context, right? Yeah. But what are we? Where are ourselves? 
who are we? Exactly. And writers yeah. answer this question. Mm -hmm. And part of part of what I do as a, as an independent press, which is what all independent presses do, is provide a place for writers to have a voice. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give it to anyone who's listening, or anyone who wants to read the book. Um, mm -hmm. My hope is that that goes far and wide. But mm -hmm. I know that there are a lot of blocks thrown up in our way. Um, but that's sort of the, I, I, I do operate from sort of an activist space in that sense. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. activist in the sense that my poetry, let's say, is traditionally activist, but uh, in tone or in subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is just a short story. Sometimes it's just a poem about living on Camp Road. Right. Um, yeah. But that the act of publishing itself where there was not a space for these people to be published before, mm -hmm. that is activism. Right, right, and, yeah. um, and I hope that people do pay attention eventually. Mm -hmm. So I try my best. Yeah, so let me ask you, so um, I know you could say you have a limited edition. Mm -hmm. If they were to give, um, say, a tax exemption, take lift the 42%, will that bring down the cost of the book? Oh, um, perhaps. Uh, right now, it's all really, um, set up costs for my business, not so much for books. Um, it depends. Some, my, my re most recent book, Saltwater Healing, mm -hmm. I just use paper I could get locally, except for a special slip of paper inside that's French marble paper. Okay. Uh -huh. But um, that was quite a bit to, to bring into the country. Yeah. But, um, I, we have a very limited paper supply. Um, we do okay enough, but it would be great to get more variety. Mm -hmm. But so probably it would bring down the cost a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then, then you'd be able to you know, just get your, your books into more, mm -hmm. a larger population. Right, yeah. yeah. And probably into the schools as well. Or right. any of your books in the schools yet? Oh, no. <coughs> Not yet. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm actually working on doing now is also expanding Poinciana Paper Press's online presence because, like I said earlier, the future of publishing isn't an either or model. It's mm -hmm. not, it only has to be physical books or it only has to be digital printing because both sides suffer in that equation. Right, right. Uh -huh. You don't realize their true potential and mm -hmm. the ways that these things can actually work together. Mm -hmm. I want to start thinking about, I want to keep doing physical books, of course, right. but also have a digital publishing component where we can, because the thing about teaching children these days, right, it's different from when you and I were in school, yeah. because we all learn from books. And of course, books are still in school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when they all are out <coughs> of school, what do they do? They go online to play the games, to go check their Facebook or whatever else, yeah. right? Mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. a d it's a different time now, check their email and, and all of that. So I want to make something online that's interactive, that has, um, all of these stories on there, or some of them, um, mm -hmm. so children can go and read online the stories or purchase ebooks okay. and, um, and mm -hmm. encourage reading that way. Uh -huh. um, and I've recognized that, that, but that's the future, is the way that we can realize that the printed work and the digital work can, work, can go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you right, a really good right. example. In 2000, I think in 2011, Mm -hmm. One of the authors I published, Nicolette Bethel, she did, uh, I published her book, Mama Lily and the Dead. It's a okay. collection of poetry, beautiful, beautiful collection of poetry. Mm -hmm. Nicolette approached me and she said, I want to publish another collection of poems um, that a friend, uh, in this new way that a friend of mine is, is exploring. Will you be my editor? And I said, of mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. because we have similar creative, you know, principles and all of that. So what her friend was doing, her friend's name is Nick Sebastian, she was doing something called a nano press. And it's uh, it's sort of an online kind of experiment and it's now expanding through her where the published work appears as a book, but the book is a blog. So you can read everything for free online. Oh. So you just go to the blog, and the blog is the book, the table of contents, the cover art is there, whatever. You can go read um, all of Nicolette's poems, if anyone cares to look for it. The poetry collection is called Lent slash Elegies. Gorgeous collection of poetry. And 
so you can go on there and just read all of them. Sometimes you can even hear her uh, reading them. You have an option for a recording. Okay, okay. You can buy the printed book. Mm -hmm. You can buy the audio CD. And you can also buy the ebook. So you have all of the options there mm -hmm, at your mm -hmm. fingertips. Okay, and so because people still do want to read, people want to save the book in this physical form. At least I do. Um, I still right, I right. read some books on um, my iPad. Right. Mm -hmm. But if I like the book, I'm going to buy it. Right. And I'm going to keep it. Mm -hmm, it might just mm -hmm. be me. But quite a few people are like this still. So that's one of the ways, that's a really exciting way that the digital world can be used to expand our um, you know, our preconceived notions about publishing and what, what books can be. Because if you give, you know, you give a 10 year old boy a book, he's probably not going to be very excited about it. Mm -hmm. But you say there's a website and there's an interactive component, it's probably a little more exciting for him because mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. doesn't feel like it's the age of the dinosaurs right. given like a book. Yeah. No. But you know, here in, in, in New York City, uh, there are a lot of um, poetry reading going on. Do you have that in Bahamas? Not as much, of course, no. That has, um, hasn't caught on yet? We have, uh, there are definitely uh, open mic nights. Okay, for poetry. For poetry, yeah. Okay. For also for singing or anything in between. Um, but um, super formal poetry nights as well. Not too many, no, not anymore. Mm -hmm. And one mm. of the one of the programs I would like to do under the press is, and, and it's actually inspired by the Center for Book Arts here in New York, okay. where I took um, s several classes uh, in college, and I'm taking several classes now while I visit New York. Okay. Uh, it's a wonderful place for, for book arts and letterpress printing and yeah. all of that. They have a series called the Broadside Reading Series. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they invite a selected number of poets every, you know, spring or fall or summer. Mm -hmm. And they, the poets give a, a poetry reading in this sort of like elegant, um, nostalgic space with all of its letterpress, you know, machines and all of that. Okay. So they give a beautiful poetry reading and then people pay $5 to come to the reading and that what goes with that mm -hmm. is a printed, a letterpress printed broadside of one of the poems. So okay. it's one poem hand set and printed with some artwork, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. gorgeous stuff. I have a couple of broadsides and I thought that is such a beautiful idea. Yeah, and I would yeah. really like mm -hmm. to do a poetry mm -hmm. series under the mm -hmm. press. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be at the press, of course. I was, I, I'm thinking, um, I'm in talks with collaborating with a couple of gallery spaces actually. Right, but right. printing a broadside of the poets, one of just one of the poems, mm -hmm. is very elegant and it's a and it's a keepsake for coming right. and it's an affordable keepsake yeah. too. But you know, um, a few months ago they were talking about um, art form as a, another way to to get folks to students to read and also to be to focus. Mm -hmm. And um, I find poetry is another f form of of the deeper thinking mm -hmm. that that um, that is touched when reading poetry. You know, I, I attended um, Angelique's um, launch. launch here in New York City. It was um, it was May second. Oh, May second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, at Blue Stockings. Yeah, which was it was very wonderful of them to host us. Yeah, great I, space. I, uh, great space. Yeah. And there were three, three, um, two artists introduced. Right, Angelique, and mm -hmm. and it was really it was a beautiful evening. It was such a great. Uh, and um, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoy um, the evening, especially seeing that it was a homegirl from the Bahamas yeah. re uh, reading, uh, and her f colleagues from you know college, uh, and I, I I find your book, you know, this is one of your. Uh, books that you published. Yes. Um, that the end, the, the book, the first pages. I found very interesting the way how the the senses right uh, are, are illustrated. Yeah. Um, was it difficult to print to print this? It's our. It is our first um, sort of full color printing expedition at the press. Okay. Um, uh -huh. And so what it what it. Saltwater Healing is a myth memoir, right? And uh -huh. it's it's called that because it's a it's a series of collages using physical material, photographs, written work, um, pieces of plants, fabric, 
sand, seeds, all of this stuff. Right. So Angelique collaged all of this to work through um, difficult childhood stories mm -hmm. through the beautiful landscape of the Bahamas and the ocean, the place where she grew up and called home. Right. Almost finding refuge and then finding a way of healing mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. that process, right? Right. right? So we thought, okay, we have to um, publish these in full color. And um, it wasn't difficult, luckily. I have a, a good printer to do that now. Um, but it does, of course, make the book costly because it's full color. At least half of the book is. Some of her poetry is at the end, of course. Mm -hmm, but, right, um, right. but it was definitely an adventure. And what's exciting is it marks um, another book in which uh, we're sort of, Poinciana Paper Press is moving a little bit more into the visual arts. And my two next projects also have to do with combining writing and art. Mm -hmm. So, which is exciting to me. I like that in-between space, you right, know? Right, right. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. uh, most, you know, you go into a bookstore, where do you put a book like that? The problem is you can't market books like that, right? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't fit into a category. Is it poetry? Is it, you know, is it an art book? Yeah. Is it, what is it? Is it a uh, memoir? So, that's what small presses are about. They like they like these in between spaces. They like to mm. give voice to the spaces that get ignored because they're not marketable enough. Right. right. Angelique would have a hard time marketing this book, and yet we are almost sold out. Oh, so beautiful. we might even yeah. do a second run. It's quite okay. exciting. Good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, no, I found we've got a, quite a crowd there, mm -hmm. and a uh, very appreciative crowd. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, she did very well. She's her sold, reading was she fantastic. Sold, yeah, yeah. She is really. Um, Excellent reader. We had originally, you know? by the way, um, launched this in the Bahamas okay, because it's okay. the first full-length edition book mm -hmm. that I've done since I moved back home. Okay. So it had a lot of challenges. Um, I wasn't, I you know, I had some confidence crises and things like that because I didn't have all of the equipment I'm used to at my fingertips okay. to do my books mm -hmm. because all of my previous books have been done on whatever equipment you know, wherever I was working at the time or studying at the time. Mm -hmm. And I would ship all of it home and then make the books at home with people. We'd oh, have okay. binding parties and I would teach people how to make books. Okay. That's how I used to pub publish my books. Okay. So this was the one done entirely at home. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a gorgeous launch at Dungalik Studios right. on mm -hmm. February uh, 3rd this mm -hmm. year. So, oh, okay. and both of the launches were really exciting. Angelique and I felt great about both of them. We had wonderful crowds. Good, and beautiful. it was really exciting that we had one at home and then one abroad. Right, Because right, that's, yeah. that's mm -hmm. it's our first launch abroad. Uh -huh. So, okay, because I've always okay. shipped my books home to launch at home. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was my first launch abroad. And, yeah. um, and I felt like it was very successful, and Angelique was pleased. Yeah. So was I. <laughs> you, you think that because it was Angelique, she is quite a, a crowd pleaser. She's, she's definitely. <laughs> or, or the, and she can draw the crowds. Or you think that um, poetry does have a space? I think poetry has a great space here in, in New York. I mean Nassau, I'm talking oh, about. Oh, in, in Nassau. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, poetry has a space in Nassau. And people are excited about what the press is doing. Yeah. And also, um, it's Angelique's uh, first you know, full-length poetry book. So mm -hmm. I think all of these things influenced a good okay. crowd to come out. Right, Plus, I right, think we did yeah. it on Super Bowl Sunday, so the fact that we had a crowd oh, okay. <laughs> was That's very exciting. Uh -huh, we called uh -huh. it the Poetry Super Bowl. Okay, okay. And you watch a Super Bowl after the party? <laughs> I don't, the I don't know. <laughs> Super Bowl. I don't, I don't uh, do that, really. I'm uh, more of a, I'm more, I throw parties to watch the Oscars instead. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Super Bowl. Yeah, okay. Now, now you have several other... Yeah, so... Um, these prints. These prints here. Um, so what's really been exciting, I mean, so many things have been exciting about setting up this press back home. And oh. some... Some things have been really pleasant surprises as well, and this is one of them. When I um, first started moving things from the Craftsman Press into Poinciana Paper Press, mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of exploring because this, this was a very large commercial press. He had several presses. He even had a, a monotype caster. He used to make his own type out of like hot lead and stuff. Okay, right. It's right. not really for me, so I didn't take it, but, mm. um, but he, you know, it was quite an operation in there. So there's a lot to go through. Mm. And so I'm going through drawers and I'm looking at the different type cases and seeing um, you know, if it needs to be repaired or all of that and what kind of fonts are hanging around. And I came across this several drawers of what were called cuts. 
what is it called? Cuts. Cuts. Oh, okay. Okay. So I call uh -huh. like I call them my vintage cuts. Okay. Right. So right. Um, they're they're blocks. Right. With right. Uh, with designs, mm -hmm. you know, logos or just like decorative pieces and all right, of that right. uh, mounted onto wood, sometimes solid lead as well. Right. It just depends how big it is, because mm -hmm. the bigger it is, if it's made out of solid lead, the heavier it is, right? right so, okay. so sometimes mounted onto wood, sometimes out of solid lead itself. And they were all covered in all of this dust, so I didn't know what it was. And I started like polishing them off, you know. Right. And I'm looking at it, I said, that's a logo for the Nassau shop. That hasn't been around for decades. <laughs> Right. That's so. amazing. And so I, I took all of these. This is the first thing I, I took out of the Craftsman Press, the first thing mm -hmm. I restored. I took them all into my studio because my studio was at a separate location. And I just started cleaning them uh, with vinegar, just taking the, the dust okay. off, just uh -huh. seeing what was there. And um, there were some real treasures in there because, like I said, this, the Craftsman Press closed in the early 80s. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. and it must have been operational, I would say, from the late 50s onwards. Okay. I would say uh -huh. even mid 50s onwards, mm. at least, mm -hmm. judged by the things I found. Right, right. And so I would find, um, you know, I found a really groovy um, cut color. of. The Montague Beach Hotel, which okay. I watched being demolished when I was three years old, right. um, but that was such a that's such a Bahamian institution that is now gone, mm -hmm. along with the Nassau shop, now gone. The Cat and the Fiddle, also like oh, a the very Nassau shop is gone too. Mm-hmm. It's John Bull now. Oh, it's John Bull. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, but that was around for our, that was the place, yeah, right? right? That yes. was the place. Yeah. So, uh. um, and then also uh, the Cat and the Fiddle. Which is there as well. Right, right. Um, that was a very swing and nightclub. Uh -huh, very, very important. Uh -huh, right. Um, to, and then there were a couple of other nightclubs. The Blackbeard. Right, the Blackbeard's Blackbeard Tavern, Tavern. That was a, a bar. Mm -hmm. um, and so I. And there are so many other things too. There's, um, gosh, there's like the Silver Slipper, which right. is an old nightclub, oh, wow. the Zanzibar as well. Yeah. Um, I also even found an old UBP wheel. Okay. So that's dated. Uh huh. Um, there's an old map of Nassau that's in there in the in the pile I brought today, right. which shows um, Nassau circa the bridges <laughs> from Nassau to Paradise Island. And when Paradise Island was called by its true name, Hog, Hog Island. Island. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought this is amazing, you know. And the more I cleaned them off, the more I found that there was so much history in these drawers. Yeah. And so I just started printing them because I thought. These are memories that are cherished by so many Bahamians, no matter, mm -hmm. you know, from, from where we hail. Right. We all hold really special memories about the Nassau shop. Yeah, We definitely. all remember yeah. the Montague Beach Hotel being part of the landscape for right, so long. Right. And, the, and sort of like the hole it left when it was demolished. Mm -hmm. You know, we all, people have stories about dancing all night at the Cat and, Cat and Fiddle. Fiddle. Yeah, Zanzibar. Yes. Going to matinees at the Cat and Fiddle. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and that's a lot of history. The Cat and Fiddle has serious history in Nassau. Mm -hmm. But so I just thought, I'm going to start printing these and I want to just share them. I yeah. want to share them with people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I've printed them and whenever they're out on display, people just come up and go, oh, I remember when my um, grandfather used to work at the Cat and the Fiddle or... I remember going to the Nassau shop with my mummy every Saturday morning, and that was our yeah. thing, and all of this, you know, and that's that's heartwarming to me. Right, And yeah. that's, you know, that's part, the community part of Point Santa mm -hmm. Press that I like. So I just I just make these prints, and there are so many more. I wow. I'm actually planning on um, doing an interactive feature. Again, this is part of the digital expansion. Mm -hmm. An interactive feature on the website where you can see every print. I'm going to print all of them. Mm -hmm. It'll take a while. But I'm going to oh. print all of them, and you can see the print, and you can actually share your memories on the page. Oh, okay. How many How many prints you're, you're, you're talking there are about? There are tons. Whoa. I have drawers that are this big. Wow. Five of them just filled. Now, some of them are just decorative pieces. Some of them are like flower flourishes, or mm -hmm. um, some of them are like very strange. But um, Do I think they were Do you think a, note, a notebook with, with uh, yes. probably uh, mm -hmm. the cover? Um, I'd love to do postcards. I'd love to do notebooks, um, things like that. So yeah. I, I also have to check, if, you know, make sure that um, all of the rights are okay to do these things. But uh, for the most part, um, since they don't exist anymore, there actually are no more rights attached to them. But just in case, you know, right, something. Right. How would you go about doing that? Not sure. 
but uh, it's all part of the learning process. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Now you said that um, you you grew up in the Bahamas or you mm -hmm. born in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me something about your yourself and your family? Sure. Um, well, I was uh, born there. Okay. And um, however, my parents uh, hail from elsewhere, but they did make their home in the Bahamas from an early age. Okay. Uh -huh. My father's side of the family is from England. Right, and right. like so many um, being oh, inherited, yeah. right? Oh, right. Um, yeah. uh -huh. and my, my, my ancestors are from England as well. Right. So, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of us can say that. Right. Um, right. So his his side of family hails from, from uh, England and they made their home there when my father was very, 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 very young. Mm. And then my mother's side uh, hails from Argentina by way of Denmark. Okay. And they ended up there through some pretty extraordinary circumstances, uh, and she was at 14 years old, and okay. so um, and they met a couple of years later. They've been together all these years. I don't know how they do it, <laughs> but <laughs> you're doing something right. Uh -huh. And uh, the rest, as they say, is is history. Okay. So they they've okay. they've stayed, and uh, and I've loved growing up there. Mm -hmm, I went mm -hmm. to the same school my whole life. I, you know, everything. So mm -hmm. moving to New York to study writing was the first time I ever lived away from home. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So growing up in uh, with your father from England, your mother from Australia via Argentina. Did, Argentina. By, yeah, by Denmark. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and you're being Bahamian born cultural wise. How did those three cultures integrate? How did you, oh, we... how did you find, find, you know, your mother <laughs> having a different type of... <laughs> right, right, right. Um, fine, you know, <coughs> my parents are great. They've uh -huh. been, um, they've been like, they're my number one fans. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> and they've been like, you know, which in a way I go like, of course you have to be my number one fans because you're my parents. Right, but right. still, um, their support is just totally amazing. They, they've they supported me definitely financially through this venture for Poinciana Paper Press, but beyond that, like emotionally, because right. starting up something like this, is uh, is hard. I think already, if you're a creative individual, there's always that concern by parents of how are you going to make a living and all of that. And usually that comes out as discouragement. Mm. But my parents always instilled in me that my creativity was powerful and was meaningful, I and okay. that I could do something with it to change the world mm -hmm. and and to support myself. Right, I don't need to be right. starving, starving artist. Mm -hmm. So that was so important to me growing up and still continues to be important because I still have to tell me these things when I have these crises and I think, forget it, I'm just gonna be a receptionist <laughs> <laughs> or something, you're like, you know, I can't do this anymore. Um, they always come through and really help me out. So, mm -hmm. um, and in terms of just culturally, we, we have our little traditions, but, um, but it, it was just, um, I never thought too much about it, but I, I yeah. do know that, um, what I have in my family is very special, and I do cherish it. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, um, your your mom traditionally, what uh, what was tr tradition that she brought to the family from Argentina? Oh well, we, well, something very small, I, I guess, is that we um, we when we celebrate um, Christmas, we do it sort of in a very European way. So we. Um, Christmas Eve is actually more special than Christmas Day, okay. in a way. Yeah, so we have yeah. our big, we don't have a big Christmas Day dinner. Mm -hmm. In fact, Christmas Day is just like eating leftovers because uh -huh. our big Christmas dinner is Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. So yeah, we do yeah. like, and we do all of the British and European dishes, like goose and red cabbage and all of the stuff. So okay, interesting. Um, that's, a, that's definitely a very treasured um, thing. But uh -huh. for the most part, um, you know, What's been great too is that my my parents have always exposed us to our um, not only cultures around the world but the cultures that were meaningful to us as in a family. Right, so I've right, been to Denmark. Right. I went to Denmark when I was 14. Okay. Um, I've been to London many times. Been to England many times. Mm -hmm. um, I've been to Argentina twice, um, and we have we keep our family connections alive in all of these places. So I feel like very blessed to have sort of almost a global family, right, right, um, right. but also to be able to um, be back home and uh -huh. to sort of take what was just so inherently Bahamian around us, around me growing up all the time right, into right. myself. Uh -huh, and I wasn't uh -huh. able to see that or value that until I left because, okay. you know, you don't get to, you know, 
see right. what you have until you don't have it no more. Right, so right. Yeah. I went away okay. and um, and even though my time in New York was also very special and, and I love New York, um, I was able to see how growing up in the Bahamas was actually a very very special thing. Yeah, you know, we, right, we right. have a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they even sometimes forget that we have so much already. Oh, yeah. That's why, you know, uh, I'm president of the Bahamian American Cultural Society. Yeah. And um, that's one of our mission is yeah. to expose the culture exactly. um, to Bahamian, Bahamian Americans. And, you know, which is through, so important. Yeah. It's great so, that you do that. Um, there are just uh, a few, I think, in uh, November, we had uh, Bahamian, our first Bahamian art exhibition here. Right which was really um, very nice, well attended, and um, folks were really pleased. And I got a lot of support from the artist. We had a, it was huge. It is said that it was the largest art exhibition they've had at the Schomburg. That's great. To date. <laughs> so, I mean, Bahamian so. artists are, we're, you know, we are really conscious of the fact that we no longer have to work within our shores or within this vacuum. Right. It's, right. it's a whole new world out there. Uh -huh, the mm -hmm. digital world is making the globe shrink, you right, know, and we right. need to start thinking about what we have to offer exactly within the global conversation. Exactly. So yeah, the fact yeah. that they were we have excited to think, doesn't we have to think, surprise me. Uh, outside exactly. of the box. Right. Yeah. But still, yeah. of course, supporting the inside, but the idea is that there's no sort of the people who left and the people who stayed and, and this sort of weird um, situation that sometimes happens in the Caribbean and right. the, in the diaspora, but uh -huh. instead it's this all-inclusive, integrative, really exciting conversation, I mm -hmm, think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and, when I was, and, and you know, talking with you and, and all of these uh, historical, you know, this, I mean, this is all of our culture, <laughs> I, I, I say, you know, yeah. black beards, cat and fiddle. It is. Uh, and, uh, it's it's a part of who we are. It is, and uh, you know the Montague Hotel. Um, does it come in larger print? Because I would love to um, have an exhibition here in New York City, right? To show these. They're uh, very they're small. No, they're very small. And um, mm -hmm. the only way that they could be larger is if they were, you know, digitally Digitized. expanded. Okay. Uh -huh. um, and then printed like, um, you know, digitally, mm -hmm. or if I partnered with a New York-based press. And I was able to blow them up digitally, make pr make plates, and then print them over here on maybe like a Vandercook or something that has a larger press bed than I'm, I have at this time, at this uh -huh. moment in time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's definitely possibilities. But for now, okay. they come in, in small because, you know, small like this. they were yeah. used, I suppose, I, I'm just guessing, in uh -huh. like adverts or on stationery or something. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Wow, they're really unique. They're very nice. They're lovely. Yeah. I, I, it's a special yeah. experience every time I get to print mm -hmm. a new one. Yeah, well, you know, um, I'm looking at your, your book here and uh, hearing An Angelique um, read from a book the other night. Um, I'm going to be interviewing her, and um, you know, I love for her to to you know share this with my audience. Cause, I'm sure, um, she would love to. She, you know, she really, um, you know, put her soul into to reading this. She did. That, it's a uh, deeply personal work, yeah, and it comes yeah. it comes right through. It the comes page. through. Yeah, very powerful. And um, it, you know, it's it's nothing like uh, hearing you know the author it's read. Always different. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because I mean, then you get the background stories too. Yeah. And a couple of her poems, you. I didn't know. I mean, I've heard right at Blue Stockings, of course, uh, again. But in our first launch at Dunglick Studios. Um, she would share the background story for some of her poems and they were really touching and they put such a different context around them for mm -hmm. me to understand them yeah. as, a, uh -huh. as a reader uh -huh. and a listener and it was special. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, now, what, what do you plan to do in the future? What, what's, what's ahead? You know, um, so many things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I dream really, really big um, and I am a doer. Uh, so I do uh, get things done. Sometimes I drop the ball, which I hate doing, but um, but I, I'm always trying my best, right? So the future is I, I'm going to, I have two more books in the works right now that I'm mm -hmm. hoping to release in the second half of this year. Oh, and, and those two books are, you're, you're publishing them or mm -hmm. yep. is your work? No, it's, um, it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, whose it's, work is it? So it's two, two books. One of them is actually a series of books okay. um, coming in a box set. It's oh. actually, it's quite an, it's probably the most ambitious project I've ever done. So mm -hmm. we'll see what happens. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's a collection of poetry and artwork called Pictures at an Exhibition. 
and it's poetry by obadiah michael smith whose book i've published before in the china shop and other poems. he's one of the first books i published under the press. so it's poetry by obadiah michael smith inspired by the artwork of stan burnside who's one of our master artists of the bahamas. brilliant painter. so he's going to take the artwork and put poetry to it? we're going to have both in our books. yeah poetry and And artwork. right and And it's not going to be exactly illustrative because obadiah's um, Obadiah's work, you know, is both external and internal, right? There's a lot going on. He's not mm. just saying, like, there's a green lizard in the painting, and that's it. Right. He's, you know, there's a lot going on as he sees artwork, because that's how we experience artwork, right? We mm. come at it from a personal angle of how our days have been, what our experiences have been, right. um, what sort of archetypes we attach to, whatever's in the piece, you know, things like that. So it's a really beautiful reflection of the way that we interact with artwork, and especially mm. from such a fantastic perspective as Obadiah is really exciting. So what what he's been doing though is he's been doing this with Stan's work for I would say about a decade, more, Mm -hmm. over a decade. Uh, Every time Stan has an exhibition, Obadiah would go and he would get inspired and write about them. So we Mm. have seven exhibitions um, spanning over, I think, I would say like 15 years or so. I'd have to double ah. check, but it's around, it's, you know, it's quite a length of time, basically. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And we're going to have every um, exhibition be its own little book, and it's going to come in a box set. So you can just read okay. about every exhibition and, and, you know, look at the pictures in the exhibition. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So that's one project, and that's something that um, they have asked me to do for two years now. So, um, They've been very patient, as I've been setting up. And right now we are we have the poetry and we're gathering the images. And I have mm-hmm. the paper. Everything's okay. ready to go. So okay. we're just, you Beautiful. know, getting it all set. Mm-hmm. And then the other project that I'm really excited to do is a project with Antonius Roberts, okay. um, who is also another um, major artist of the Bahamas. Mm-hmm whose painting works and sculptural works have been hugely influential right. in our development as, you know, um, an arts sort of society. And so uh, that's really a little bit more art-centric. So that's okay. uh, like a complete departure from literature. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But it's a series of his paintings of, um, you know, everyday Bahamians, just portraits of them. Okay. Um, it's about 24 images. Uh, beautiful, you know, seem like unassuming paintings, but there is a lot going on when you get to sit with them and look at them in the book. So okay. you get to have this sort of intimate experience of exper- of looking at um, Antonius's work from about the 1980s. Okay, is so this in color or is it black and white? They're sort of in sepia tones. They're colored, Co- but um, color. they they come through um, in sort of like a sepia toned oh, okay. uh, thing, okay. which is interesting because you're sort of looking back in time as well. Right. At the time, that's how we painted them, but now we're looking at them and it's a little bit back in time. Right. Um, so we're seeing like an old Nassau, right? But also thinking, well, but how much has still changed? How mm-hmm. much has really changed? And right. how much is still the same? And um, we're going to have just a critical introduction in the beginning and a statement from the artist, and then you just get to look at the work. Okay. And it's called Vintage Roberts because, of course, it's his older work, uh-huh, and uh-huh. he's he's done so many other things since then. Right, and right. Uh, and that's going to be a really exciting handmade edition as well. Mm-hmm. So I, I like to, to make notebooks while I watch TV, and so um, I usually present them at Christmas festivals. So I'll be around like a jollification. I'll be okay. at um, uh-huh. probably the BAIC craft fair. Right. And um, so that's really, and by that time, that's the end of the year. So right, I don't right, have too right. many other projects besides, of course, always setting up the press. Yeah, good. Now you mentioned that you, you worked in um, wedding invitations, you printed. Mm-hmm. Is, is that something that you might incorporate? Definitely. Well, I, um, when I finished my studies at Pratt Institute, mm-hmm. I stayed for an extra year. I worked full time at Peter Crudy Editions. I mean, I really got to learn the ins and outs of a commercial print shop. Um, you know, the challenges and successes. And, um, of course, so that's something that I would like to, to do back home. You know, there aren't too many art grants or any uh, sort of structure set up to support artists back mm, home. Right. There are a couple. I mean, I'm not saying that there's none. Mm, mm. You have the individuals and the organizations who do care deeply and who do help, but we mm. always need more. There right. are a lot of really talented young artists coming up right now. I mean, mm. And I'm not saying that just because I'm in the art world and there. Right. I am really excited to see 
what's going to happen in the next ten years but all of all of them specially young artists need funding and we're all doing other jobs we're all working in other things and doing our work in our spare time but that's not how you develop your you know cultural identity as a country you have to fund projects here in New York there are so many systems set up there are tax breaks we have no tax in the Bahamas right so there are tax breaks there are like grants there are people just trying to figure out where to put their money and they all they put it into the arts and you get this great return on your investment right well you know they have the New York City cultural department so know, you know so they, they need something like that in the Bahamas so that funding mm -hmm. sponsorship can come right. into that particular organization and go to, to the artists because sometimes yeah, you never area. know where the sponsorship goes to if right, it goes to right. the government so, exactly. um, yeah. but so that is something that you know the artists need to, to consider yeah artists um, are we, there are different initiatives um, you know artists are helping themselves actually recently Antonius Roberts did this show called Ripple it was part of Transforming Spaces, which okay. is a uh, island-wide art tour that happens every um, spring. So we just mm -hmm. had it in March. It was very exciting. I'm on the co organizing committee, okay. and um, it's a bus tour to like. This time we had eight galleries. So it was a bus tour to eight galleries in one day. You have some wine at the galleries. You see some really exciting artwork, all of that. Antonius, who has a gallery space mm -hmm. um, called Hillside House, he decided to use the opportunity to have an auction, and the auction is called Ripple because this idea is that it's a ripple effect, right? Okay. That what you invest goes you know, outwards and outwards and touches many people. And so um, it was a sort of uh, non-traditional auction mm -hmm. and all of the funds go towards developing art programs okay. by artists. Mm. And it's only, it's handled by artists. It goes oh. through artists' hands, it's handled by artists going into art programs that artists believe in. Mm -hmm. So we are also controlling our funding. So that's, very exciting, and it'd be great it's, it's if great. more that's of that yeah. happens. But again, when I mentioned that there's a small market for books back home, mm -hmm. you can imagine for art as well, it's also very small. And it goes right back to the fact that we don't teach anyone to value art right, in right, our right. schools. That aside... And uh, art, like I mentioned, is another component to the three R's. Right. So art, these two, I mean, it's, it's moving it, in the Bahamas mm -hmm. rapidly. Right, um, and Artists um, are ta we are taking everything into our own hands, which is exciting. Do you do hard cover or just um, soft cover? Um, for my chat books, I do soft cover just because it's cost effective. Soft. However, uh, I do make hard cover notebooks. So it's been a pleasure, and um, I wish you the best of luck and um, and much much success. Thank all you very much for having me on your show. Sure. This is very special. Thank you. Thank. You.